Hello there, my name is Gary Sims and this is Gary Explained. I really hope you had a good weekend. What did you do? Maybe uh, time with friends and family, maybe some sport, hiking, movies, playing some games. I, I hope you had a good time. You know what I did? I installed an atomic clock in my PC. Yes, an atomic clock in my PC. If you want to find out more, please well, let me explain. Okay, so here it is. It's called the Time Card. This is an open source project. And this big block here is an atomic clock. There's also a GPS receiver, an FPGA. We'll talk more about the details uh, in a moment. And it allows me to have atomic clock level accuracy for the time inside of my PC. Now, there's lots of things to cover here. I hope you've watched my other two videos about time one defining milliseconds and microseconds and nanoseconds, the other looking at time synchronization, NTP and PTP, and how computers are able to kind of have the same time across the network. Now, when you have time distributed across a network, you need a high quality source of that time. And from that previous video, I explained that Stratum Zero are kind of the GPS satellites that we have or the uh, GLONASS satellites, whatever navigation satellites are being used in your part of the world and other sources like radio frequencies and radio transmission stations that are connected to atomic clocks. Now I mentioned atomic clocks there, so what are those? Well, some materials have specific resonant frequencies, which when you put them together in a clever way, which I'll talk about in a moment, you're able to get a fixed oscillation, a fixed clock out of the uh, setup and that allows you to measure time. In fact, the official definition of a second is using a cesium atomic clock. Now, cesium atomic clocks are mega, mega expensive, but there are cheaper versions using rubidium. Now, a rubidium mini atomic clock can actually fit onto the PCB uh, that can go inside of a PCI card and inside your PC. And the way it works is really, really clever. If you have some rubidium gas and you shine a laser through it, the laser goes through the gas and gets to the other side and can be detected using a photon detector. Now it turns out that if you then bombard the rubidium with uh, microwaves at its exact resonance frequency, some of the atoms will absorb the laser light. That means the amount of light being received at the other end starts to dip. And the closer you get to the exact resonance frequency, the less light is received. So you can actually have a feedback system where you can shine the light through the rubidium, some of it gets to the detector at the other end. You then tweak the frequency and see whether the amount of light that goes in goes up or goes down. And when you found that sweet spot, you found exactly the resonant frequency of uh, rubidium, which is 6.8 something, 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 I'll probably show it here on the screen, uh, gigahertz. Now that means you've now got a way of naturally creating a fixed clock. And that means if you have a rubidium clock and I have a rubidium clock and they're tuned exactly to that resonant frequency, we're getting the same clock signal out, which means we can then turn that into seconds because we know that it's 6.8, whatever it was, uh, gigahertz. And that now gives us a stable signal wherever you are in the world, regardless of whether you're in the Southern Hemisphere, the Northern Hemisphere, whether it's summer or winter, whether the Earth is wobbling or not wobbling, whether there's magnetic fields, you get this constant clock signal out. And that's what the basis of the time card is. You've got a mini atomic clock, which is built on the board, giving you this very steady pulse coming out. And then you sync it with GPS. So there's also a GPS module on there that's able to connect to all the various different uh, satellite navigation systems, gets the fixed time, and then it can sync up the time in the clock with the time from the GPS. And now you have a stable time source. Now, why would you want to do that? Why not just use GPS? Because there are occasions when the GPS signal might be lost. There could be atmospheric conditions. There could even be criminal activity. Or in fact, it can even happen by accident. In 2007, the whole downtown part of San Diego lost GPS signal because the US Navy blocked the signal uh, by mistake. So the idea is if you can have a GPS signal that syncs up to a clock, a very stable uh, atomic clock, and then if that GPS sync is lost for whatever reason, that clock can keep on giving out very, very accurate time. Now, when you lose GPS signal, that's called holdover, and a rubidium atomic clock can keep the time accurate within nanoseconds over a 48 hour period without any problem whatsoever. So a great way of having GPS 
and a local time source with a failover that when you lose GPS, you get hold over. And then when they kind of say would sync back up, the time would say, oh, well, we didn't lose any time between us because you were doing such a good job of keeping the time. And that's the beauty of the time card. One of the things I love about the time card is that you can interrogate the atomic clock and you can interrogate the GPS signals independently because their serial ports, which you use to communicate with them, are exposed into Linux once you've installed the right driver. So here, for example, is a look at the atomic clock. You can ask it what version it is. You can ask it all its different parameters and you can log those and have a look at them. And likewise, here is some information coming from the uh, GPS lock. And the messages coming out of the GPS here are quite interesting. You can see the first one here is time UTC. It tells us it's accurate within 27 uh, nanoseconds. And there we can actually see the date and time. Also here we can see that this time is according to the Naval Observatory. And the other message that comes out of the GPS board is actually the leap seconds. Now the GPS system uses GPS time, which doesn't include leap seconds. Now GPS time started on the 1st of January 1980 and was accurate, synced up to UTC at that point. However, since then there have been 18 leap seconds introduced. And so there is another message that comes out of the GPS that tells you the difference between UTC time and the uh, GPS time, which doesn't have the 18 seconds uh, given. And as you can see there, it tells us there, there should be 18 seconds uh, added on. Now using the time card is really simple. You just pop it into a PCI slot designed for Linux. In this case, I'm using CentOS Stream. Once you've got the right driver installed, then you are able to talk to the time card. And then NTP servers like Crony are able then to take their time, not from the internet, but from that time card, which has been synced up with the global navigation satellite. And now it's then a stratum zero that's very, very accurate. In fact, you when you're syncing to your local machine, you can get accurate time down to around eight nanoseconds. And then if you're using NTP across your network, using that physical clock that's actually in your kind of house, in your data center, you can actually get your local client to be synced up within about one microsecond. Again, remember to go back to that other video of mine to understand what the significance is of a nanosecond. It's such a small amount of time. And if you use something like PTP, which again I talked about in the previous video, you can actually get the clock synced within 100 nanoseconds across your network. Now, a lot of the services we use nowadays, for example, social media, whether that be Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or whatever it is, they actually have to use what's called a distributed database. And that's because the copy of kind of Facebook that's running near you might be in the southern hemisphere and it's got to be synced up with a version that's in Europe, it's got to be synced up with a version that's in uh, North America, and all this data is flying around. Now, if you've done something to this distributed database, which in terms of social media, you know, you've liked a post, you've written a post, you've made someone your friend, all that kind of stuff is in a big database. And what happens is that when something needs to be fetched from that database, you have to find out, is Europe in sync with the USA? Is USA in sync with Australia? And the way they do that is actually using a timestamp. Who's got the latest version of the database will be the cry that goes out across the network. I have my one is at 21 minutes past 10. Well, I've got one here at 21 minutes past 10 and four seconds. Oh, your one then is new. You can imagine. Now, of course, computers are working at much, much quicker speeds than just minutes and seconds. We're talking about microseconds. But here's the interesting thing. If there's too much of a difference between the clocks, then actually one computer can think it has a newer version because its clock is not accurate, when in fact a different computer has the newest version. And when they talk to each other, they can actually even have a kind of a time dilation problem in that one of them might think it's actually in the future and the other one's going, hold on a second, how can you be in the future? My time is this and your time is that. And so what they actually have to do is they add a 20 millisecond delay to all transactions so that they can make sure that all those tiny differences in the clocks have actually been caught up. Now, of course, 20 milliseconds for millions and millions of transactions across thousands and thousands of servers is a big overhead. We as humans don't notice it, but of course, on a network, on a system level, that's quite a massive. Now, if you're able to sync all of those machines down to a much, much greater accuracy, then you can chip away at that 20 milliseconds and bring it back down to a much more reasonable number. And that's just one example using distributed databases. If, of course, you're doing physics research, last time I mentioned the White Rabbit Network at CERN, and of course, the timing of particles and capturing things is so, so important. 
automation, telecommunications, they all need accurate time. And because this is an open source project, it can be used as the time card, or of course it can be incorporated into other solutions so that in the future we may have network cards which really are becoming more and more intelligent at the edge of the network that have, for example, the time stuff built into the network card. Now, as I said, this is all open source, so you can actually go and build one for yourself. They are a bit expensive because that mini atomic clock itself is about $1,000, which means when you put the whole thing together, you might be looking at paying about $1,500, $1,600. However, that is nothing compared to what existing solutions are inside big data centers. Whether you are Facebook or Google or Microsoft or Amazon, you need accurate time across all of your servers. Also applies, as I said in the other video, to automation, to telecommunication, and so on. And sometimes these kind of clocks that you could get for the uh, network data center were $50,000, $60,000, because of course they weren't selling hundreds of them, so it's a bespoke piece of equipment. Now with the time card open source, all the files you need for the hardware and the software are there. That clock is only $1,500, $600, which is a big saving for the data center. Now, I'll be the first to admit this is not a consumer thing that you should run out now and get yourself an atomic clock, but you've got to admit it's pretty cool. <laughs> okay, that's it. My name's Gary Sims. This is Gary Explains. I really hope you enjoyed this look at how to put an atomic clock inside of your PC. There'll be some relevant links to where you can find out about the timing card, find all the stuff you need in the description below. I really hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please do give it a thumbs up. Don't forget you can follow me on Twitter at Gary Explains. I also have a newsletter. Go over to GaryExplains.com, type in your email address, no spam, just a newsletter. Okay, that's it. I'll see you in the next one.